the, the remit was to talk about the project, the development, how, how one does open source software development and, and, and make it sustainable and work long term and, and the, the kind of challenges that I've gone through um, from that perspective. And so this is, yeah, this is a discussion about um, open source software for science in general is the idea. And then, and then we'll be talking a little bit about Psychopy, you know, I mean, just from the basis that that informs my own experiences and what I know about. Um, but I'll, I'll try and keep it more general than that. And also, because I don't know what you guys all want to hear about, um, then just just you know, let me know, shout out, and uh, and stop me to to ask questions as we go. I'm very happy with just taking things flexibly. This is kind of what I imagine telling you about a little bit. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly introduce the project only in terms of like the history of it and that sort of thing. I'm not going to not going to talk to you about how to use Psychopy in in any way. Um, but just a little bit about the history and where it came from. Um, and then mostly try and think about things like, you know, what steps one has to go through. Imagine that you start off wanting to create an open source package. Um, and, and bear in mind that, you know, like I didn't start programming really until I was a postdoc in MATLAB. And, um, this, you know, so most of you have started programming a lot earlier than I did, uh, at least in a in a sort of real and useful sense. And Psychopy actually just started off as a as a little library of functions that I kept as, you know, helper functions for myself. So you could think of yourselves as going down that sort of a line, and and therefore, you know, even if some of you feel like, well, I've only just learned how to code, um, you. Uh, you know, you might want to think about some of these different things. And then I'll, yes, look back at my, my general thoughts on that. So I'm an associate professor in psychology. Um, and my background was in vision science. And uh, back in 2002, I was working as a postdoc at NYU. Uh, I, I had yeah, no formal training in computer science. I did always have fun with computers, I guess. And uh, and I recall that in on my um, very old computer, I wrote a, a program in BASIC to calculate prime numbers. Um, so, you know, I guess I had an affinity to it, um, but but no, no formal training, went through a psychology degree, a neuroscience PhD, and then started using MATLAB um, as sort of as my go-to tool, my go-to programming language back in the, in the early noughties. I started writing Psychopy in 2002 for my own stuff. Um, and basically what it was about was that MATLAB, so, so to put this in perspective, in 2002, there was no Matplotlib, there was no Pandas, there was no Git, there was no, all of the tools that you're learning about, they did not exist. Um, MATLAB or, and Psych Toolbox, if, if you've um, used that, so that's a, um, a stimulus generation package mostly in, uh, in MATLAB, that didn't use OpenGL in those days and I couldn't just call OpenGL commands from MATLAB. So I started using Python because I could do these things with graphics that, that I couldn't do in MATLAB at that time. And that was, that was how that began. I actually kind of went to, I, I wasn't really planning to make this package at all. I, I was talking to the people who were, Dennis Pelly from, from Site Toolbox and uh, a guy, Andrew Straw, who was writing a thing called Vision Egg in those days, um, trying to persuade them to take on my ideas and my code and do something with it because I didn't want to write this thing. Um, but they weren't really interested and, and I started writing this little suite of helper functions for myself. I put it online in a place called SourceForge. Not many people go there these days, but um, that was GitHub in the noughties. And um, people started gradually using it and they would send me emails and say, you know, could it do this? And I gradually started adding features. So I added a, a script editor and started send, sending it out as a, an app, um, a bundle um, so that people could if they didn't know how to install Python and all of the dependencies, 
we gave them that. Um, then we added a, a, a builder interface so that for people who didn't want to learn how to code in Python, they could just graphically drag and drop and create an experiment in psychology or neuroscience. That started off as for non-programmers, but that's actually what I would recommend for everyone now, even competent programmers. I, I, I wouldn't write code for an experiment by hand myself, um, and I'm happy to discuss the pros and cons of that with you later. Uh, recently, we had a JavaScript. We had a we created a um, a closed source um, repository, I guess you'd call it, for running studies, and we ended up creating a company. So all of these things are relevant, you know, quite large steps, I guess, in the life cycle um, of of this project. Down that period, Psychify has become popular. Um, so back in the in the, the you know, noughties and tens, we had hundreds, maybe a couple of thousand users. Um, these are active monthly users, and, uh, and I'll come on to that a bit later on as well. So we're now up in around 25,000 active monthly users. Um, you get to see also people go on holiday. Um, some people go on holiday. Uh, I guess students go on holiday and, and uh, researchers stay working. Um, and some people do a bit less over Christmas, although if you look at our logs, you'll still see, you know, on, on Christmas Day and Boxing Day, there will still be some people running experiments. Um, we've got hundreds of contributors and thousands of citations. It's become popular. But one of the things that's been sometimes frustrating is that despite that, it's been really hard to get funding. Um, it's been really slow and frustrating developing this stuff at times because I've been having to work up, you know, like this is not something that I was working full time on until very recently. So um, you've probably heard this about other software projects as well. You know, there's this, there's this sense that actually the universities don't much care about the development of these tools or they don't, they don't show it um, in any way um, that, that I think they should. Um, as a result, I'm, I'm, I've for a long time felt like I'm in this strange place where, where users actually, I would say, overvalue me. Um, they, you know, some, some users will treat us like uh, celebrities and, you know, I feel a little bit weird with that. Um, but on the other hand, my, like my seniors um, in, in my university really don't care. And they're like, why, why are you doing this? Well, why have you only published one paper in the last couple of years? Why are you writing this software thing? Um, and so it's, it's, it's a strange kind of place to be. So what were the various decisions and considerations along that, along that line? Um, do you want to write a software package? I'm not sure it's something that I would recommend. Um, because of those frustrations and difficult things that I was just talking about, uh, it's not going to get you promoted. Uh, and so notably, you know, I've written a, a rather popular, um, very well used package that is probably, you know, if any of you have heard of Nottingham University, that's probably the only reason. Um, is, is because of this software package, and yet I'm not full professor, right? That speaks volumes, <laughs> I think, about, about how universities um, see this stuff. So uh, if any of you are in a university that doesn't see it that way, I'd like to come. Um, so, um, it's, it's, it's an interesting and, and uh, difficult thing. It's also not a very good way to get famous, I mean, if that's what one is aiming for anyway. Um, it takes a long time for people to, to get on board with a, with a software package and, and to generate, you know, that graph took a while um, to come. And that was, that's, you know, ignoring the first few years where there was um, even less. So it's, it, a lot of this stuff is slow. But um, I personally wouldn't change it. Um, and I, I mean, I never aimed to do this anyway. It was just something that gradually happened. I started filling a hole that, 
I hadn't sort of planned or got out. It was I was just doing things that that made things work for my lab, and and that hole gradually got filled, and, and we did it. Um, so that that was what happened. There wasn't an intent to do these things in the first place. I really have very strong opinions about um, people trying to combine with other groups. So if you are wanting to write, if you've written something that's useful, is there a way that you can combine that into something else rather than start from scratch on a new thing? Let's say that uh, you know one of you creates a new way to do some neuro um, analysis, maybe some new way of unwrapping the brain or something like that, um, unfolding. Try to keep working with other teams because from a user, perspective so you know work with the nipi people and try to build into the into the existing infrastructure and tools one argument that i've heard from users that say you shouldn't use open source or the open source is is doomed because it kind of rewards people or the prestige is i created my own package and the the difficulty with that rather than i am one of the contributors to this large package, right? The difficulty with that is that you've got lots of people creating lots of small packages. I said that in the noughties, there was no matplotlib. In those days, there were about eight plotting packages. And they, so you had to use one if you wanted a 3D plot, you had to use one if you wanted a bar plot, you had to use a different package if you wanted lines, you know, it's like, it was, it was maddening, or if you wanted an SVG output, you wanted a different package, um, it was maddening. And it was because lots of people were starting from scratch, creating their own package, rather than let's all you know, coalesce around one thing. In most other software domains, you'll see packages like operating systems growing and gradually doing more and more stuff in one system. And, and it almost feels like open source incentivizes the opposite. So that's something that I think we need to work on. But a part of it is get in touch with the existing teams. You know, so if, they, if their package can't do something, can you add it to that one rather than starting from scratch? Okay, so let's say you've started, you've, you've, you've been writing some code. Um, it's kind of got to the point that you think it's useful. A few decisions that you've got to make um, that I would say uh, relatively boring, although some people love this stuff. Um, what what license do you want to use? Some people are still going with closed source licenses. Um, I, to me, that doesn't make sense. But um, and, and to me, that was never really a consideration. When I started with Psychopy, I was like, well, I've got these functions. I'm going to put it online. I started off with an, an MIT or a BSD license. I can't remember which. Um, so these permissive licenses say you can do what you like with my software. Um, and GPL um, says, You've, if you use my software and redistribute my software in your own product, that needs to also be GPL. And that's going to stop certain sorts of people from basing their work on your library. So I started off with a permissive license, and I would prefer that in most cases. I think, you know, if you're writing your code, you want it to be used as widely as possible irrespective of whether the person is going to use it for gain or not. That's my very personal um, view on it. PsychoPy is now actually GPL licensed because we've got lots of other libraries inside it and we've, we've got kind of got to. Um, but I personally would go these two. Doesn't matter. Different people have different opinions, um, but those are the things you've got to choose. Where to host the code is largely now kind of decided. I, I, um, GitHub is by far and away the most likely place you're going to put it. There's also GitLab, which is an open source alternative. If you're afraid of Microsoft, um, you know, doing nasty things, then you could use GitLab, which is a very similar concept. Um, but GitHub's great. It's, it's free. It's got a wide range of features. It's got lots of stuff for you to so, so you can you know, use the issues lists, um, you can use, uh, they've even got like forums built in now that you can have discussions on. It's got testing frameworks, all sorts of things. You also want to uh, think about where you're going to host the documentation. And I would even say GitHub is great for that too. So GitHub has 
the pages um, facility, where one of the things that's fantastic is that they're also going to sort out for you the security certificates, the, the SSL certificates, which means you don't have to keep on going and updating your server certificates um, with your correct domain, na domain names and, and buying certificates and that sort of thing. So GitHub is, I would say, a fantastic choice for nearly all of that too. I would say buy a domain name. Um, I think that's, it's really useful. It gives your project credibility to see that it is, you know, mything.org rather than mything.github.pages.io, etc. So I, I think that's really worth doing. If you're choosing a name that's not, um, that's that's not too sexy sounding, I don't know what it is. I, some some names sound popular and cause lots of people to want to buy them. Most don't, um, and and will cost you about ten bucks. So so just choose one that doesn't cost you four hundred pounds. Um, choose one that costs you ten bucks. Thinking about a name is also something that's interesting because did I add that? No. Um, yeah. What name do you choose for your library? I've seen a lot of people choose names that. Um, are going to be really hard to Google. And, and I've always found that a bit strange. You know, if you call it my library and someone searches for library on Google, what are they going to find? So, so names like NiPy, where it has meaning, it's going to be easy to remember, but also if you search for n i p y, I've got a three-year-old daughter, so that's how I spell things now. Um, if you search for NiPy, you are going to find NiPy and not something else, okay? And, and I think thinking about what would someone get if they Googled that name is, is a, a useful exercise when you're starting to create your package. Okay, then how do I, I, I've had quite a few people down the years ask me, how do I, I've written this thing, now how do I start getting users? Where should I advertise my new package? Because I want users. Um, and I kind of don't, I, I never did that. I, I don't know. I, I suppose you could, you, you could go and advertise, you know, buy credits on Google ads. You could go and, uh, ask for, I mean, advertise in a conference proceedings or something. I, I didn't, um, to me, if you're writing something for which there is a genuine gap, right? So in my case for Psychopy, it was that there wasn't a Python, there was one other Python package um, that I thought was very difficult to use. So to me, there wasn't an easy Python package that allowed people to create the stimuli I wanted in Python. Um, so that was, that was a thing that I was sort of, uh, a niche that I was filling. And that meant that if someone was to go to Google and search for how do I create a random dot stimulus in Python? Well, they would find PsychoPy, right? There was, because they were, it was filling a gap that some people were, a, a small number of people were going to go and Google Python, random dot kinematogram, Python grating stimulus. They were going to find my package. Um, and the other one that was a vision egg that was, I think, a bit harder to use. They would go and have a go with each one of those and, and they would make a decision but there wasn't a problem of them finding me. Um, next step, yeah, make it easy to use. Oh, we have mentioned the name. Make it easy to use. So I think there with Vision Egg and Psychopy, you would find these two packages. You would look at the documentation. You would find that one was a bit easier than the other. You would use that. That's, that's what most people would end up doing. Um, unless there was a real feature that you needed in, 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 in package B. So, Making it easy to use is also hugely important because finding you and then finding that it works is, is a really critical feature. Can they look at your documentation, look at your demos and say, oh yeah, I made it happen. I installed it based on that one line, two lines, um, and I managed to get the demo to work. I'm, I'm up and running. Um, if you give people that, that step, then they're likely to give it a, a genuine go. Um, so make sure that that does work. 
and make you know you've really got to try and think in terms of what would a user who hasn't done this before think will they really manage to get this to work if you get all of that right then i don't think you need to advertise you know <laughs> your people are going to start using your software and they're going to start telling their friends i downloaded this thing it was free it worked and it you know it was really cool um so then they will spread the word and and then other people will start using it they'll mention it at conferences they'll mention it on their posters they'll do stuff other people will start using it too um so that that works well and while i say all of this but i was actually also frustrated and there were times after a few years when psychopi was you know quite um feature rich and other people and i was still seeing people use this e prime and it was driving me crazy like why are they still using e prime when we've got this thing um but don't be in a rush because actually if psychopi had grown faster than it did i would have been in trouble and and i didn't know that at the time but now i look back and and see um how time consuming it is supporting thousands of users if you try to do that while writing the software you won't write the software so actually don't be in a rush because having hundreds of users is hundreds of like enthusiasts that's really good people people like ariel who are going and jumping in and going oh i'm going to go and work with this thing and then john it doesn't work oh but i've gone and fixed it you know like those sorts of users you want around at the, at the beginning if you grow too fast you get all of the other users who don't try very hard don't fix anything don't know how to write um a support request and and those are not the users you want when you're just starting writing software so so i think that's also worth noting um if you're going down this route i would start writing tests from the beginning if if this were me you know on projects that i work on now starting from scratch write the tests at the beginning as you go always you know even if you're not going to share this with anyone else it's it's just a really useful way to to code um and i think that works really well so i would do that psychopi doesn't meet this very well at all partly for historic reasons but mostly because it's an application um that's hard to test in in a, a graphical user in, interface is very hard to test in github um so it's it's a bit tricky for us but but for most other things and certainly analysis pipelines and that sort of thing um test suites are, are just fantastic i'm not going to say much more about that just it's good community management is a it's an interesting and, and uh, uh, that's one that I see a lot of projects, I think, get things a little bit wrong. Um, I, I don't know quite how, how or why. Uh, our community grew fairly organically and was always super positive. And, and that was, I think, a big selling point now of, of the PsychPy community. Um, how do you get that? I, I, and I don't quite know the answer to that certainly it's useful to have decent software so um, we started off with a google group because again that was all there was in those days um we moved to to a, to a discourse forum um so if you've been on the psychopy forum you'll know um that kind of a look and you'll see that discourse um you will see that kind of familiar look and feel in lots and lots of forums these days um so discourse is really nice in terms of i mean it, it's just pretty it formats messages nicely it's feature rich for the user for the for the but it also does things that are useful for you so it it gives people points and badges it gamifies helping each other and and that's nice um for for raising the community involvement it's also got things to sort of auto detect that this post is quite similar to this other one you don't want people to ask questions repeatedly that are all about the same so um you know, forums like discourse have a lot of support for that sort of thing too um one slightly odd suggestion is don't rush to answer questions um, that that seems very counterintuitive 
what I discovered, so I, for a while, I, I just answered questions as soon as I thought they came into my inbox and I just answered the questions straight away. I wasn't having that many per day. It was okay. And then I went through a period of kind of not being able to. And what I noticed was that that didn't mean the questions didn't get answered mostly. That meant that someone else answered them. And people were holding off answering each other's questions because they were waiting for me. And actually, you know, holding off, say, 48 hours, I mean, it's still good to get questions answered in the end if you've got capacity to do that. But holding off 48 hours means that someone else can come in and answer that question too. And you might see more community growth, paradoxically, by not answering questions too quickly. Um, some people will be like, I need it now, must help me. I've got to run my experiment this afternoon. My supervisor is gonna kill me. Um, but, but you know, most people don't need that level of urgency in getting their question answered. And, and so um, on the whole, you can, you can hold off and, and, and let people um, chip in as well themselves. Usage tracking is really useful in terms of knowing, if you're going to apply for funding, if you're going to tell your department that this is worth you spending time on, you, the first thing they're going to want to know is how many people are using your software. So it's useful to know that. And then that opens sort of a question mark about, well, how, how do you track, how do you kind of use, easiest thing is to count downloads of a package. But that's, particularly I think in the open source world where, where releases are fairly frequent by design, um, that's quite difficult to interpret. So if you've got version four that has a thousand downloads and version five has 1100 downloads, how many users do you think, have you got 2100 users? Because they each download one package and one version and stop? Or have you got 1100 users? because everyone from version four upgraded to version five. How would you ever know? It, it, you know it's, as soon as you've got just two versions, it's sort of impossible to tell. You also don't know they downloaded it, they found it didn't work and they binned it. You know, how many times have you downloaded a package and it didn't last the day on your computer? Um, so a lot of people would be like that, or they downloaded it once the other way around, they downloaded it once, and installed it on 30 machines in their lab. Um, so you might also underestimate. So it's just, it's just really, really hard to interpret. You could like look at citations of a publication and we'll come on to publications a bit more in a minute, but that's a massive underestimate. It's a massive delay. You know, if you, if you create a new package and wait for citations, it's gonna take years um, for, for that to start happening. Um, and, and you're gonna get depressed and not, and not do any more. Um, so yeah, that's not great either, even if people do cite your study or publish their study. Ideally, you want to monitor act monthly active users. And so this is back to that graph from PsychoPy. Um, PsychoPy pings a web server when you launch the app and we just track how many people are pinging that web server um, and what it's coming from. That, that might sound sinister and creepy to you. Um, in fact, it's a lot less. The information we store from that is a lot less than every time you go to any website ever. Um, and there are opt-outs, you, um, you can avoid that. But, but you know, it's to generate this graph and solely for that, so that we can go and say, how many actual people used it, roughly? Um, this is still probably an underestimate because a number, this is based on IP address, unique IP addresses and then um, if someone, if an entire university uses a proxy, then all people in that university look like one person. So it's still an underestimate, but, but uh, it gives us an idea. Ariel, how much time have I got? What, how, how long should I be talking for? I've forgotten. You have another 15 minutes. Okay, cool. Um, so publications, as I said, kind of horrible. They woefully underestimate use. Um, but 
on the other hand, they are kind of still what academics expect. You know, if you're talking to your colleagues who don't write software, then they're going to want to know how many citations you've got. Um, frustratingly, even if you have got a paper with lots of citations, they still won't think it's equi equivalent to a real research project. So, so even when you get it published, it's, it's not all that useful, but um, it's still kind of what you want to do. So it, it, it's still worth trying to get that sort of, by the time you're um, you know, large and established, you can publish in regular journals, um, like by, by which I mean things like you know, um, neuroscience methods or, or that sort of thing. Um, but for your smaller packages, you know, once you've, when you've been working on them for, you know, a year or two or something like that, um, then think about these two, the Journal of Open Source Software, which I think Ariel is uh, a, an editor of actually, um, and the Journal of Open Research Software, which I'm actually an editor of. Um, the, these, are, these are places that are dedicated and I, and between you and me, I like Joss more. Um, uh, the, 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 these are places that are dedicated to publishing papers on software. So they're not going to ask you to fit your article into the traditional method to results conclusions kind of a format or anything like that. Um, and, and, you know, they're a very useful way of looking, but they will want to look at, is your documentation any good? Did I manage to install it easily? Um, does it do the thing that you say it does? And that, that sort of thing. So they're, they're, they're very good for younger packages. Okay, let's come on to that, that question about sustainability. So um, how do we make open source software sustainable? Why would one need funding? Why would this even matter? Because surely, you know, I built this thing myself in my evenings and weekends, other people are joining in with lots of us, we can all manage to do that, right? It's, it's fine. Um, well, kind of no. Um, most open source projects written in evenings and weekends, um, uh, there's a limited time over which people are willing to do that. Um, so, so people, get often frustrated with the way their users are harassing them when they're giving their time for free, um, things like that. You get older, you might have children and your, your evenings and weekends have other uh, pressures um, or you just you know move on to a different project and start working. So the, I mentioned Vision Egg earlier, Andrew Straw changed field and stopped developing Vision Egg because he was doing something else and, and it was no longer relevant to his life. Um, most open source projects have a bus or truck factor of one or two. That's how many people have to get hit by a bus or truck or win the lottery and stop wanting to work on this um, before the project dies. And, and even big famous projects. So there's, a, there's a, a link there. We're going to share these slides later, I guess, aren't we? So um, there's a link there to... Uh, a, a study of these things from 2015 that showed, you know, big packages. Pandas had, in 2015 had a bus factor of two. So if two people got distracted, went elsewhere, pandas would stop running. Um, pandas would stop being developed. They're, uh, they're fragile is kind of what I'm saying. You might say that's true of commercial software as well. Um, and, and in a way, if a commercial package dies, then, then you're in more trouble um, because you don't have the code to continue developing it. But still, um, open source projects are kind of fragile because of this issue. And as a project grows, if the contributors don't grow with it, it becomes unsustainable. And I was certainly getting to the point with PsychoPy where our user base had grown so much I mean, we, we did have contributors as well, but still the pressure on my time as the user base grew was growing enormously. And I was struggling to work out how, you know, how am I going to do this as well as supervise PhD students, write papers, get grants, run lectures, you know, teach first year undergraduates how to do t-tests. Um, so for me, it grew beyond what I felt we could do in part-time support you know I was having issues like 
I know there's this bug. It will probably take about two hours to fix. It's affecting quite a large number of our users. You know, and if you're talking 50%, that's, that's now 10,000 people are being affected by this bug. But I haven't got two hours in the next six weeks because my calendar's too full. Um, and that was frustrating me. So how do we fix that? How do we get to the point that I can say to my department, I should be doing this instead? Funding was, is basically what it comes down to. Um, there weren't many grants. Um, it took me 15 years to get our first sizable grant in, in PsychoPi. That kind of, I think that's improving, um, but it's difficult. One of the things that's difficult is that to get a grant in anything, you've got to show that you could do the job. But in programming, to show that you could do the job kind of requires you to have done the job. Um, and then what are they going to fund you for? So it's it's a, there's a, you're in a catch-22. Um, but it, it, that is improving. And a lot of the packages you now know um, have been funded now by, by Chan Zuckerberg um, in recent years. So that, that's really great. I tried also getting departments to fund this. I, I went to them and said, well, rather than you all buying E-Prime licenses, which costs you tens of thousands of pounds, why not club together to pay for a developer on PsychoPy? You, know, you each put in 1,000 pounds a year and we hire someone full time and, and then it will be better. And none of them wanted to do it. Um, so I, I, I got zero positive responses from any universities um, around that because they basically were like, well, if we don't put in a thousand pounds, it will get done anyway, eventually, won't it? Which was sort of true, but um, but not as well. And it was, it was, yeah. could you write a book? Well, books don't sell. We did write a book, um, books. And, and we we sold a few thousand copies of of the the Psychopy book. They make a couple of pounds per copy for the authors, and so that's not going to keep you in business in terms of you know hiring staff to run a project. Can you commercialize? So um, our last step was was ending up doing this using the concept that you've got a large user base. And you don't need any, you don't need a large percentage of those to chip in, but a few pounds from a few of them. Um, so what you might start thinking about, and you can start thinking about this relatively early on, can you do training? Can you run workshops? We've, we started doing that PsychPy on a you know, yearly, once per year in the, uh, to, for, for a long time. And that generated you know, a, few, a few pounds here and there to buy a laptop but not to pay a full member of staff. Now we're running staff, we're running PsychPy workshops every month and we're paying someone full-time to do that. Um, so you can, with large numbers of users in the end, you can get to that sort of a place. Consultancy, you know, I started doing that. People would come to me and say, could you help me write my experiment? Could you test my experiment for a couple of days work? Um, and, and initially, um, that wasn't great when it was my time, but now we can do that again with a staff member and it, and it works very well. Um, could you add premium wear, um, open core model? That's where you, most of your package is free and open source, but you bolt on um, paid for services on top of it. Like, you know, it's like it could have been, um, the main psychopath is free, but you pay if you want to use eye tracking, something like that. Um, if you've got a permissive open source license, that's quite easy to do. So you can add paid for and open source pieces together. If you've got a GPL license, you can't quite do that, but you know, that's how we're now doing um, pavlovia.org. We're not packaging anything, so that's fine for GPL licenses, um, but it connects to another service. Be careful about, you know, don't, don't go overboard with charging people. The idea is to keep it free for most people and tiny payments from a few using the fact that, you know, your open source packages will have large numbers of users. And, and so um, I kind of viewed it as, you know, clash of clans, the phone, mobile phone. Nearly everyone used clash of clans for free. 
they just download it on their phone. Uh, and, you know, lots of phone games have that model. Um, and then a few people would in, would who basically did it all of their time. They spent loads of money, um, and and that kept the whole thing afloat for everyone else. That's kind of the way that you can think of it. A small number of users spending uh, well micro payments each time, but lots of them sometimes. Um, that can fund the rest. I think these are really powerful models, um, and and something that we should be you know, encouraging throughout the open source world ways to make open source software that's actually got full-time staff um, and, and making that work. And, and we now have eight to 10 full-time staff in open science tools. That's partly driven by the, the um, COVID drove up the number of people wanting to go and use Pavlovia quite dramatically. Um, uh, but, but, you know, this actually, once we started going down this route, we found that it actually worked very well. So, so three of, well, we will soon have three staff that are working on workshops and consultancy. Um, so I think, you know, it's a, it's a powerful model that, that we should be looking at more because it makes open source tools, I mean, much more reliable hopefully you know we get more time to test we get more time to um polish the software than me in my evenings and weekends okay so yeah um it wasn't this was never the plan this all just each little step was just adding one more piece and kind of i ended up here um i've been working on this full time now only for the last 18 months out of that 20 odd years um and uh um you know it's been fun it's been frustrating it's been lots of ups and downs um and uh i'm not sure i recommend it but i, but I wouldn't have changed it that's kind of that's kind of my take-home message um so yes thanks to python people early adopters contributors many supporters of various types and and, and to our funders as well any questions? Good. Yeah, let's open this up for questions. For polls. Hi, yes. Um, oh, uh, uh, Ariel, do you want to call out names while I? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, I see Savannah's hand is up. Yeah, uh, so this is really interesting. Uh, my, my husband is actually a software developer, but like on the industry side, for not uh, research things. So it's cool to see this from the research perspective, but, um, and also thank you for getting me my dissertation back in like 2016, because mm -hmm. I coded my entire experiment in PsychoPy. And that was actually my question is, um, you mentioned that you now recommend that even like experienced coders um, use the, the, I don't even remember what it's called. I never mm -hmm. used it, I used the mm -hmm. console. The builder, and at least back then, right, I was coding it in like 2014, 2015. Um, it really, I found it not powerful enough to do the very complex sort of swapping and, and randomization stuff that I needed to counterbalance my very complicated experiment. What's changed since then that has made it now worth using the builder versus like just kind of coding this object oriented sort of setup from scratch uh, in the, in the, in the text editor? Mostly um, the difference is that, yeah, the, the features have gradually added um, into, into Builder um, so that more of the things that occasionally needed code only now can be done in Builder as well. Um, you would still have to use code components, but the code components, because of the wonders of Python, can do extraordinarily powerful things. So, yeah, I, I really should write a, a blog post on, on the various reasons and arguments that I've heard for, no, you should write your own code, um, and why each one of them I think is incorrect. Um, you can nearly always, like say, say it's about counterbalancing and, and uh, create, you can write uh, functions that do all of that, that you can import into your script in a code component to do that, just you don't have to worry about the stimuli and the saving the data files because Build is going to take care of that part for you. When future you comes back to your experiment, 
and, and can visualize your stimuli in the builder workflow, um, then you don't have, the only part that you've got to work out again is how did I do that counterbalancing in, the, in those lines of code? Um, future you will be able to reproduce your experiment better and, and understand and tweak your experiment better. So that's, that's the first reason. Second reason is that an awful lot of people make relatively small mistakes, but those can have quite big impacts. Um, and it can be things like just the, the library has changed and has improved and the way of doing things that we recommend has changed. So you would have written your code using event.getKeys or event.waitKeys. And if you go back to that experiment now, you'll reuse that because your knowledge about the package hasn't moved on. There's a keyboard class now that's much more precise than event.getKeys. Builder knows that your experiment should use that. But the coder, the, the person programming, unless they obsessively go through change logs, they don't get to know that update, right? So, so there are lots of those sorts of things. I think of it now as, um, now that Builder is you know, very feature rich, I think of it now as, well, Builder is a description of your experiment, which you want to be constant, but it works out how best to implement the experiment at runtime. That's actually what you want that to happen. You, you want the new version of the experiment to be optimized for the current world, for the current runtime, not necessarily the rest. The other reason is that it can now push your code out to JavaScript um, because it's an abstraction of an experiment rather than how to implement it. It can send it to JavaScript code as well. Whereas yours would have had to have been manually transcribed, which would have been horrible. Not, not dissing the quad, your code I'm sure is beautiful, but translating it to JavaScript is, is, is not fun. <laughs> cool, thank you so much. Hi, go ahead. Thanks very much, John, for uh, being a strong advocate for open, open source community. And, and I would be very interested in learning your experience um, talking to clinical collaborators. In, in your case, it's maybe your psychologist and whether they use it, use the psychopath primarily as a research tool or as a real clinical product. Because the way, uh, this is more or less like a comment to open source community why uh, uh, clinic, clinical institute, sometimes it's, they, 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 they still prefer a close, close source model and, and willing to pay for it because of the, they, they can risk of a, a, a mistake in the code uh, that can be a life death decisions making. So yeah. this is something that's perhaps also related to your point on how to make open source software development a sustainable and reliable issues. And I'm very interested in learning your thoughts on this. Yeah, there, there are sort of, I think there are two um, aspects there. And we do, certainly we do have people in, in clinical spheres um, using PsychPy, um, but the majority of users are not. Um, I, I think there are two things that dissuade people. One about, about, so one is that we've got this GPL license, which means some clinical kind of oriented software companies would like to create a battery of tests using PsychoPy and then sell it to other people. And they kind of can't because the GPL license means that they would have to share their work. And, and yeah, I've had some interesting discussions with people saying, well, no, we, we couldn't use that. I mean, then we would be putting on all this work that people would steal from us. Why would we do that? And they're like, well, you're here. Um, anyway, uh, so, so the, that's one part, the licensing. And, and I say, I would actually prefer if we didn't have the restrictive license um, to allow that to be more possible. The second part about a concern about quality of code, um, I think that comes back to that sustainability thing. So we're, I, I wouldn't say that we're there yet, but we are professionalizing our code generation and our work 
a, a great deal and, and we're moving quite rapidly in that direction. Um, and I think, you know, in a couple of years time, because we've got this model of open source, but professionally programmed, um, we, we have that option. So I think trying to find ways that, that open source code can be, like you're not concerned about that for Mozilla, right? Mozilla is open source, but is funded. And you're not concerned about the quality of the Mozilla browser. So, so I think it's, it's, we need to separate the concept of open source from the concept of code quality and try to find ways to, to up the quality. Thank you. Okay, let's take uh, one, one last question from Alberto. Go ahead, Alberto. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Right, so first of, first of all, as everyone else has been saying, thank you much, so much for advocating for the open source uh, model. Uh, I was wondering, so there is this thing called Google Summer of Code. Like, has it been like a possibility for you to get involved into that kind of activity? Like, in case anyone doesn't know, it's a program where basically Google funds health fund interest for open source projects. And I don't know if it's like a good a good investment of time because it's actually also like a learning process for most of the interns. I don't know if there is that trade off between like having to dedicate time to train people and like getting some more contributions without having to invest like actual money aside from the time. So was the question, could we use Google code in order to, I mean, the, the Google code. Summer of code. Summer of code. Summer of code, yeah. Um, we, I haven't gone that route yet. Uh, we've we've talked about it occasionally, we've but we've never actually approached them. Um, it's I guess another another question, sort of related, is if this is a venue for training. Have you had students who've spent a significant amount of their thesis writing Cyclebuy? Some, yes. Um, yeah. So that that certainly has happened. Not not from computer science. So the the the, queer, the issue with summer of code. Um, type of contributors um, is that if they're coming from more of a computer science background, they, um, my experience so far of people coming from that direction have not, they've not been as useful as the, the, the sort of people who are coming here, neuroscience, hack, you know, enthusiasts who, who have a purpose to adding that code. Um, those are the people who who contributed most um, to, to cycle by is it's more, yeah, PhD students and postdocs from mostly the neuroscience world um, that, have been, that have been really great contributors. Um, you know, Summer of Code, I'm gonna to have to spend so much time explaining to this person who's got nothing to do with this field, what the purpose is and where they're going to, that uh, the, the cost benefits and that would, would be very positive. Um, so I, I haven't done it. 